episode one of season five of the Overseas Famous Podcast. I am here with NBA Hall of Famer, one of the greatest players ever to play in the NBA, a terrific human being, and one of the original fighters for players' rights, Rick Barry. Rick, thank you so much for joining us today. We're very excited to have you on the show. Well, I'm happy to join you too, Kevin, and hope everybody is uh, is doing well under these uh, crazy circumstances we've been living in over the past few years. <laughs> so going into the, you were the pioneer for players' rights. Uh, people th- were lo- labeled you, they're like, oh, he's difficult, when really you were just fighting for the voice of the player. And a lot of things that you did as a player have helped, you see it helping generations of players now. Uh was that difficult to kind of hear that noise when people were just like, oh, you know, th- saying things like, oh, he's selfish and things like that, when really you were like, listen, you know, we're, we're, this is why people are here. This is all right. We should be fighting for these things. I should have the, my say in where I go and where I play in my contract and things like that. Well, let me clarify some things. Back when I first started playing back in 1965, it was like athletes are supposedly dumb jocks. You know, you're not supposed to have a brain. You shouldn't have an opinion. You just do whatever the hell you're told. Uh, And I I wasn't born that way. And I wasn't. That's just not who I am. I mean, I always have an opinion about everything. It's gotten me in trouble a lot of times, but I'm still entitled to my opinion, whether you like it or not. And so when I made the decision to do what I did to leave the NBA and and go play the uh, in the ABA, it wasn't a decision that I was going to leave for sure. I was. And what, the thing that hurt me most of anything is saying I have no sense of loyalty, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's such BS because I honored every contract I ever had. I gave the Warriors every opportunity to keep me. I told Pat Boone and, and the, the people from the Oaks, I said, look, here's the deal. Give me your best offer. I'm going back to the Warriors. And if their offer is anything close to yours, I'm not leaving. It is that simple. OK, so that's straightforward. Very simple. No problem. For whatever the reason. The Warriors, I don't know why they did it. They they basically came back with, with a low ball offer. And so they gave me the opportunity because I really, in my heart, wanted to try to go because I thought I was going to go back and play for my then father-in-law, who was my college coach, Bruce Hale, because I was on a team that was played against one of the greatest teams in the history of the NBA and lost in six games, the 76ers in 1967. And... We came within two pick and roll plays involving Nate Thurman, myself, and Will Chamberlain that had they gone our way, we would have won in six games and had an amazing season. In my second year, I mean, I made first team all pro as a rookie, which doesn't happen often. I'm second all pro my second year. I lead the league in scoring. I'm the MVP of the all-star game. And I didn't have a lot of fun. Came within two plays of winning the championship. Unfortunately for me, uh, and I really liked him as a person, but Bill Sharman was my coach. He's a great player, obviously, you know, top 50 player. But Bill had his way of doing things. He wanted us to do it the way he did, and he was kind of fanatical about it. And he had the he had started the morning shoot around stuff when it was just basically getting up with your sneaks and jeans on and going and getting you out of bed. Uh, and now it's turned into a full scale workout. And probably one of the things I dislike most about my whole career is the morning shoot arounds. I think it's the biggest <laughs> waste of time ever. No, seriously. I mean, what the hell do I want to use any energy at all at ten o'clock in the morning when I'm going to be playing forty plus minutes a game that night? Yep. Know what the reason was? Get you out of bed so you don't lay in bed all day long. But we Uh didn't have the luxury of doing that because the players today fly on on charter planes. They get done with the game. They have all these catered meals and stuff. They still get the hundred and fifty dollars a day per day, and we had eight dollars a day. And they get to the they get to the next city at two o'clock in the morning, and so they can get a good night's sleep, you know, whatever. But and then you can get them up, you know, at noon time or whatever, and have a meeting. But no. Us, we get up at 5 30, 6 o'clock in the morning to catch the first commercial flight to get to the next city to be able to go. So it wasn't that we had the luxury of being able to sleep in very often. We <laughs> had to get up and take commercial flights. So it was a totally different world. And for people to say that I was selfish and money hungry, no, if I was if I had to do it over again, I would have been that way. Hell, I should have gone and said, Hey, here's the deal. Give me your offer. What do you got? I go to the wars. Hey, here's what they offer me. What are you gonna offer me? Then go back to them. I should have played one against the other. I would be <laughs> but I didn't do that. And so for everybody to have this terrible feeling about me that I'm, you know, money hungry and no sense of values, that's bullshit. I mean, it really is. And so, you know, I did what I had to do. They gave me the opportunity to do what I, in my heart, felt like I wanted to do. But had they given me the offer that they came out to the press with and said, which was not their original offer, I would not have left. I wouldn't have left the Warriors. I would have stayed. But everything in life happens for a reason. And 
if that had happened and I'd stayed with the Warriors, I might not be where I am today. I might not have the most amazing wife ever with an amazing another son, Canyon, my youngest son. I wouldn't have that. So things in life happen for a reason, folks. Accept that. You know, sometimes you don't get the answer right away. That's going to happen the next day. It might be weeks. It might be months. It might be years later that you're going to understand and realize why something happened in your life. And so accept that. That's just the, that's the reality of it. I've been around a long time now. I've seen it. I, in fact, my son, oldest son, Scooter, sent me something that I have hanging in my bedroom here in Colorado. <laughs> and it says, I said, everything happens for a reason. Okay. And it's true. It really is true. So just, you know, and if you get, and if it's something that's sad, something that makes you unhappy, cry and get over it. Move on. Don't swallow in self pity. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Don't get depressed over something that you can't freaking change. Once it's happened, it's over, people. It's nope. over. Move on with your life. I see so many people who just not only do they screw their life up, they screw all the people around them's lives up because everybody's trying to help them out because they're so depressed and everything over something that can't be changed. I mean, oh. but I've learned, I've learned, Kevin, most people don't have the ability to do what I'm able to do, which is I can compartmentalize things. I can take things and put them on the back burner in the back of my head and not think about it. People say, Rick, you miss playing. And I say, no. And then they look strangely at me. Really? I said, yeah. But the reason is, is I don't ever think about it. Uh -huh. well, I don't want to think about the fact that I never again for the rest of my life will be able to do something that I love with such a passion and just was such an integral part of my life. And I'm never going to do it again. Who the hell wants to think about that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to focus on something that's going to bring me some joy. Think about the next fly fishing trip or my next pickleball tournament or, <laughs> or something else, or go watch my son play basketball. I mean, my God, I mean, you have control of your life, folks. Take control of it. Grab it with both hands and take control of it. Don't let these other ancillary things impact your life in a negative fashion. So there's my preaching for today. No, I love it. I think just the, it's so hard when you're as an athlete when you retire because there's it's just crazy but if you can just focus in on okay now there's something else now there's something else not sit there just you know dwelling on the past and instead move forward and you know create a new thing I, I that's my dad always told me like you know don't you know don't ever settle just keep going keep going so you retire from basketball now what it's right, always and also, now what? and also never be satisfied with what you've done i mean feel mm -hmm. proud about what you accomplished but never say okay i got it now no you should always strive to get better you should mm -hmm. always strive to improve i mean hell I, I became a better free throw shooter i was the best free throw shooter in the damn game you know and and yet i i worked at it and changed it you know that's why i had so much respect for tiger woods he's the best golfer hell a uh -huh. couple of times I changed his swing why to get better yeah. He wanted to get better. He saw something that could help him get better. I, I discovered it myself. I wish the hell I had been smart enough to do it early in my career. But my last six years after I made the change to my father's technique, I shot over 92% my last six years, which is better than anybody's ever done. That's why I say I still think I'm the best free throw shooter. My last two years, when I was shooting less free throws playing with the Rockets, when you shoot only two or three free throws a game, it's hard to shoot a high percentage because yeah. if you miss a couple of free throws, you have to go an eternity to get it back up to 90-something percent. And my last two years, I, I averaged over 94% from the free throw line. In fact, Andre Drummond from the Pistons, when he was back with the Pistons years ago, in one game, I think it was 22 or 23 free throws in one game. That's in my crazy. last two entire seasons with the Rockets – I missed a total of 19. That is why I'll brag about it. I'll, Kevin, yeah. I brag about it. Why? It's the you only should. part of the game of basketball that you could be selfish and help mm -hmm. your team. That's very true. It is really, I mean, everyone always says you're selfish, you take too many shots, but a foul shot, it's just you in the basket. It's just you. You just get your you points, go get in there. How do you live with yourself? You can't make 80%. I mean, my God, you can miss one out of every five. And that's 80%. And you have the same size ball, the same size basket, the same distance every single time. So if you miss, it's all on you. It's only because you didn't do something technically correct. And so I know that in those last two seasons, there were 19 times I was very upset with myself because I missed the free throw knowing that I did something wrong tech technique-wise and caused me to miss that shot. I love this because the free throws, I know – 
you're an NBA Hall of Famer. You're one of 10 players to average 15 and six, uh, four. I think you had like around two steals a game, like one and a half steals a game. But people always like come back. Like when they think of you, they think of the underhand free throw. And I'm like, this is the guy who, and I'm talking, you know, talking with my dad about you. Uh, it's, it's great. Cause he watched you play intently. So when you're, when you're doing that in like the, this day and age, I feel like a lot of people focus on the three th- free throws. You were one of the greatest free throw shooters, but does it bother you when people like think of you just as that motion of free throw shooting? It's like Jordan with the shoe, like that, that dunk, but they're, it, it, does it ever bother you when you're like, all right, listen, I made all my free throws. It doesn't matter how I did. I could have kicked it up there. I still made them. Yeah, no, it does. I mean, it's just, it's nice to have a signature, you know, thing that you did. I mean, you know, it's unique. It's different than other people. So, I mean, that's a nice thing. But the thing about it is, I mean, I wasn't just a great free throw shooter. I mean, I was a damn good basketball player. Yeah. I, mean, I had no glaring weakness. I wasn't a terrible defender. It would be ludicrous to me. That when I hear <laughs> when I hear this on broadcast, I almost want to throw up. Seriously. I hear a former player say, well, this guy's a lockdown defender. I say, well, shit, maybe you got locked down. Nobody ever locked me down. What the hell are you talking about? There is no such thing as a lockdown defender if you're a scorer. A yeah. scorer can never be locked down. You can make somebody work harder, but you can't lock me down. I have too many weapons. Uh-huh. I mean, I, mean it, I don't. I only need to get you make the slightest little lean, and I'm owning you. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it, it's so simple when you break it down. And so that's why I, I have a very difficult time listening to broadcasting uh, broadcasters and games a lot of times because i see things a lot differently obviously than i think a lot of these people do and they're talking about stuff i said why the hell are you talking about that why didn't you talk about this and you know it's really interesting because i remember one time it happened to be doris burke and uh and i turned the sound was down and i was watching the game with some people and we were just having a talk i said look i'm gonna tell you i'm gonna keep the sound off and just watch okay the, the play all got it got done and everything and I stopped it and I said, I rewound it and I said, okay, I'm going to tell you something right now. I will bet you anything you want to bet right now that what's going to happen here is that it's going to be talked about. This is what's going to be talked about. And I'm going to tell you what is not going to be talked about, but what should have been talked about because it really was the essence of the play. And so <laughs> the play came out, first of all, the defender made a bad play. The person went to the basket and drove and they talked about, well, what a remarkable pass it's going to be. So they're going to talk about what a great shot. Oh, what a great defensive effort, blah, blah. What they didn't talk about to me was they didn't talk about the fact that the person should have passed the damn ball because they had a teammate <laughs> wide open on the baseline. And so I put it back on, and sure enough, it's exactly what happened. Talked about all of that. Never said one word about the fact that they missed a wide open opportunity to pass to a teammate, which would have been an easy basket. And I said, this is the problem with basketball and people who are broadcasting the games, is they don't really understand the game, and they don't see the game as well as they should, and they don't make it really educational for the listener. When I did broadcasting stuff, when I, I did play-by-play, which I really enjoyed, but because I could actually – do things and step over the line of broadcaster, right? Play by play color analyst. In fact, Tony Verna, a great, one of the great uh, directors and in, in, who started with the slow motion replays and stuff. Tony said, Rick, you have the ability to do something that not no, most people can't do. You can do play by play, but you can also be an analyst because of your experience and what you've done. And you should do that when you do it. And so I did when I did that, but I didn't get to do it very often. And so that was the kind of stuff that I tried to look at. And here's the deal. You have to be walk a fine line. I think some guys, I'm not going to start mentioning names, that I think are too technical because Mm -hmm. the majority of viewers are not super knowledgeable of the game. So if you're going to talk really technical about it, that happens in football a lot. I mean, I understand it's in football. Some of these guys are talking about this and, you know, the cover two and the three and whatever. You know, most people, what the hell is he talking about? I mean, unless you're an aficionado and you really study the game, you don't understand what the hell all those things are. You have to explain it in a way that the intelligent, educated person is going to enjoy it, right? Mm -hmm. Can't be so technical that the other person is saying, just what I said, what the hell is he talking about? You can't, (laughs) and so you you can't be so basic that you insult the intelligence of the guy who knows the game. So it really is a fine line that has to be walked when you're doing that. And I I have to say, most guys don't do it real well. Well, I feel like what, Every good announcer that I've ever heard is just saying exactly what you were just saying, which is like, you're telling it like it is like you, you're not sugarcoating it. You're not saying, uh, you know, it's more real. And I like real as a real, as a basketball player, as a fan, 
you know, I follow the Phillies and I like the announcers because they're real. Like you can tell when they're sad, you can tell when they're mad. That's great. Like that's I want my announcer to be real and not have this. But, but um, yeah, if you you're watching, if you're watching the local guy, yes. Yeah. But oh, if he's doing national broadcast, you can't do that. You can't nope. be one sided. <laughs> it would be great. Now you are you talked a little bit about this. You said if you can kind of you know if I if you give me like that little bit of space, I got you. You were a great defender. You were a great defender. How would you have defended yourself? I was a great team. I was a great team defender. Individually, <laughs> in, individually, I would study a guy, and I would I, – here's the deal. Most players have a weakness, some weakness, okay? Yes. That's what I always tried to do, to not have a weakness. That's why I think I was a, a, a great scorer, because I didn't have a – I could go left, I could go right, I could shoot the ball. So you had to play me honestly. And if you play me honestly, I'm going to own you, Okay. Because all I'm going to do is get you to make the slightest little move. And like people say, I don't have, I, I'm not trying to get by my guy. If I get by him, that's great. I just need to get you. I need a half a step. If I get you on my shoulder, I own you. It's a half right. a step. That's all it yeah. is. And, and so that's what you try to accomplish. And, and the problem with the other broadcasters and the things I think that they're doing is I always told all my boys, and I'm very proud of it because I think they all did a nice job at one time or another. They all did some broadcasting work, except for my youngest guy, Canyon, who's still playing. And I said, don't, be the master of the obvious. People are seeing the same thing you're seeing. So uh -huh. if you talk about what it is that you just saw and they just saw without telling them something that gives them a little bit something extra, then you're being the master of the obvious. And you don't need you there. Why do they need you to say, oh, what a great play that was? Well, bullshit. Why? Tell them why it was a great play. What did the defense do wrong to enable that to happen? What did he do correctly to get the defense to make a mistake? Talk about something that they didn't really see so that it becomes educational for them and more entertaining. No, I agree. I, I watch football and I watch a guy like Troy Aikman or Tony Roma. I know they're both Cowboys guys and I'm an Eagles fan, but they they give you insight. I didn't play football. So when they give you insight of things that I would have no, no idea about, that's where I actually enjoy the game a lot more. When I see that and be like, oh, that makes sense. I'm learning the game as we're going. And that's great. So if, if you had to defend yourself, you talked about, you know, that you were very tough to defend. How would you defend you if make you had to defend you? Make, me, make me beat you from the outside. Okay. You don't, you don't want somebody getting to the basket, creating opportunities. Because if I, if you let me get by you, I create so many opportunities. We could wind up getting easy shots. The big man has to come. I, I'm a good, you know, I see that. I'm going to get the ball. Maybe we get a dunk from the big man because I pass to him. More things can happen that are bad for your team if a guy is – able to penetrate and get into the gut of the defense so try to keep the guy outside and make them beat you from the perimeter I, and i know that you know steph curry clay thompson a lot of these guys have changed the whole thing when i first came in the game the whole thing was here's three critical elements to be successful number one stop the easy transition baskets in other words don't get them get let them get a lot of fast break opportunities one Number two, don't let them get a lot of second chance opportunities. Screen off the boards, control your defensive board so you don't get second chance. And number three, make them beat you from the perimeter. That's what the focus was, okay? With the three-point shot coming in and the greatness of some of the players like the Steph Curry and the Clay Thompsons of the world, not only can they beat you from the perimeter, they can embarrass you from the perimeter. Mm -hmm. However, okay, however, the thing is you don't want to give them open shots and you always want to be challenging them and stuff. But if somebody's going to beat you, still, you want them to beat you from the perimeter. You don't want them to get to the basket easily. Now, you know, they can kill you because the three-point shot, you're getting three points, and, you know, not just two if you're going inside. And so, it, you know, you, you can't let somebody score more three-pointers than you're scoring two-pointers. You can't beat them. It's impossible, right? So that's the, yeah, that's the key thing. And so what you do when you study a player is find out. Like, you know, if I was to guard LeBron James when he first came into the league, I made a big deal. This shot, he was a horrible shooter out terrible for him and uh got much better but was not a great shooter from the outside still isn't a great shooter i mean he's never shot 80 percent from the free throw line but he's gotten much much better okay but when he first came in hey you overplay him force him out and as soon as you do that you back off him say hey you're not getting by me if you want to beat me you can shoot the ball all day i'm giving you the outside shot yeah why not i mean that's what that's what guys are doing with ben simmons and you know until he proves that he can make that outside shot it stifles him he, even though he's so strong and big to get into the lane, it stifles him in, in the playoff time. That's when we all saw it. 
when yeah. he well, decided he to shoot, shoot an open throws. Throws. And then the problem is he can't shoot. If he just was, even if he was just a good free throw shooter and not a good outside shooter, he still would be a great advantage because then what you do is you post him up and you get him inside because if he can make his free throws, he's still a very positive aspect for you. He's going to score some points. He's going to get some three-point plays. If he gets fouled, he's going to make a high percentage of his free throws. But he doesn't even want to get inside because he doesn't want to get fouled because he doesn't want to go to the free throw line. So – it's a real major problem for him. I mean, all the talent and skill and, and, and ability that he has is all negated because of the fact that he's not a great shooter. And this somebody should be with him, working on him all the time. I mean, he'd probably be a good candidate for a younger handed free throw because there's no doubt he could be a better free throw shooter if he decided he wanted to try that. But guys are reluctant to do it. Why? I don't know. Who the hell cares what you look like? Right? Who cares? Yeah. I mean, I said, if you can stand there with your eyes closed, throw the two hands over your head, you can make 80% or more than by God, that's the way you should do it. <laughs> How would you, if you were sitting with Ben Simmons, how would you fix it? Is that what you would suggest? I would, to I would to, tell you know, him, I would, yeah, I would try to get him to, to, to uh, well, I it will have to work in two ways because he doesn't shoot well from the outside. So I, I'd, I'd go over his form, get his form to the point where he's doing it fundamentally sound. And hopefully that would work. And then it would work for him to then practice it at the free throw line, doing it to see if he could get to be, if he can get to be 80% overhand doing it, then he doesn't have to worry about making the change to underhand it. But it's also the same way you can be shooting the ball from the outside. So, you know, a lot of people always say, well, why should you shoot different at the free throw line? Because you're shooting outside, you should shoot it the same way. Well, yeah, but if you can't make 80% or more doing it at the free throw line, the way you're shooting from the outside, well, then you should make a change. Yeah. Because 80%, if you're not an 80% free throw shooter, you are not a good free throw shooter. Mm -hmm. And well, you story, as far as I'm concerned, that's me. Eighty yeah. percent, eighty percent is that's it. Anything below eighty is to me is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. I listen. This is uh, you have those big guys. They always talk about the their hands and stuff, but it's just repetition. And I think you know, getting into the getting in and just getting that mindset to to shoot. I always look at it. You know, the fun, the fundamentals. Guys with big hands have a tendency to grab the ball. No, here's the thing. The two worst enemies in learning how to shoot a basketball, and most people never talk about it, your thumb of your shooting hand and uh -huh. your off hand. Your off hand has nothing to do with the shot, and it can create a problem, all kinds of problems. If I can go over shooting stuff, I can explain exactly the problems it can cause. And it's your thumb because your thumb can become – should never your thumb should be passive it's almost as if your thumb isn't on the ball if you've got a big hand it's easier to hold the ball without your thumb having a factor and it also lets you have more feel and, and you get way more feel because if you get your hand in the right position here and you're going up that ball is rolling up and off your fingers if you've got big hands you're really getting a feel for that ball coming up off your head and it should be easier to have great feel shooting the basketball in control with the bigger hand if it's done properly Rick, I'm, I have a confession to make. I, I got into a funk when I was playing professionally overseas, and I started sucking at the free throw line. And it, like, overtook a lot of the things, like, mentally. And I would shoot, and I would shoot, and I would shoot, and I had the same four. I just, like, mentally, it was weird. I just, I went into, I got the yips, and, you know, I, there was a stretch of, you know, you know, a few weeks where it was it was rough. It was rough. I was I was just not making anything. I remember that it's it's crazy, and I always thought. So I have a confession to make. I had some shitty free throw seasons uh, as a big guy, but at the same time, like you're saying, you had to make the adjustments. So you would go home, and that's what I did. I would try to like make those adjustments, and I think a lot of it was just confidence. Is just well, that's all, you... no, not not a lot of it. It's all yeah. It. And when I talk to people about things and businesses and all, tell them about all the wonderful characteristics you can have, you know, taking pride in what you do. And then I take pride and I break pride down into uh, in different words for what, what what constitutes pride. So it's kind of fun that I do. You know, you know, P, P is for preparation, right? You know, preparation. You have to prepare yourself properly. I mean, if you don't prepare yourself properly in what you're doing, you got a big problem. And it's there's other letters that go along with it that are repetition over and over and over and over and over and doing it the right way over and over. You have to do that. OK. Uh, and then, you know, and then I, you know, I, you have to be inquisitive. You have to be intuitive. You always got to be looking for ways to do things better. D, dedication, determination, you know, all those great desire, all great things. E, effort, education, all great things. But what it boils down to, all of those things are wonderful to have and I think great qualities, but it all boils down to the key to great success is you do all of those things, you get to the point where you, you have to believe in yourself and that's confidence. Confidence will eliminate the worst overused word in sports lexicon that drives me absolutely insane how much I listen to people saying it is pressure. Pressure does not exist unless you allow it to exist. 
you are going to be put in situations that are critical situations. The game is on the line. If you're in business, you have to do a big sales presentation for multi-millions of dollars. You should be living for those situations because you should have confidence in your ability to do what you've trained to do. I wish I could have every game I played in. I wish it could have come down to the last 10 seconds with the ball in my hand and the game on the line. I wanted the ball in my hands because why? I believe that I was going to make the shot or create an opportunity for a teammate to win that game. Did it always happen? Absolutely not. But I sure as hell believe that it would. And I didn't get down. If it didn't happen, I try to learn from a mistake I might have made to help me be better and not make the same mistake the next time. But you have to believe in yourself to really achieve greatness. If you don't believe in yourself, you will experience pressure. And I tell a long story, which I want to go into now with the superstars competition years ago that they had on television. They had a retired division. I They got me to compete in that. I hadn't trained much. But I, hey, Rick, you qualified for the finals, blah, blah, blah. So I go to do it. I wound up in that having a chance to be the only retired player to ever win that. But the problem was, is that I, I had golf was part of it. And I'd given up golf for a long time and I didn't have the confidence. I was a low handicap golfer, but it was frustrating the hell out of me. And I wound up for the first time in my life in a critical situation. I felt pressure and I choked like a freaking dog. And I vowed I would never, ever allow myself to go into anything that I'm not properly prepared for, that I have faith and confidence in myself to be able to do what it is I'm being asked to do. You tell that's a great story. I mean, golf, I'm the same way. I feel like if <clears throat> anything, if you if you have that confidence and keep going, it gets easier. I feel like golf is something I just do for fun. And you know, if there's ever pressure, guys are just like, here, let's put a few bucks in this hole. I'm like, no, like I'm terrible. Like I I'm not good enough and I'm not confident enough in my golf game to, you know, throw money around. Well, golf but has you, never been fun. It's not golf is no. too hard to be fun. It's yeah. I mean, it's the golf, remember, golf is a four-letter word. <laughs> okay it really is it's way way i have so much respect and admiration some of my my best friends ray floyd and a lot of the guys jerry paid i know so many of these golfers that i've got to meet over the years i have such respect and admiration for them having gotten to the point that i was a one handicap player and people say rick you want to go on the senior tour i said are you out of your freaking mind do you understand <laughs> the difference between me as a one handicap player having to go out four days in a row or in the senior tour three days in a row and play at such a high efficiency rate because if you have one bad day you'll never win a tournament yep it's true you talk about preparation and we talked a little bit about the three three point line you were only the three, three point line existed only for two years in your career. You ended up making 73 total threes. But when you talk about preparation, if the three point line had existed earlier, was that something that you would have you would have changed your game to accommodate well, of course. the three point line? Yeah, yeah, no. If, I mean, well, I had it in the ABA too. I mean, I was a 33% three point shooter. Okay. So mm -hmm. 33% is to me 30%. If you can't shoot 30%, you have no business ever shooting because 33% yeah. is equivalent to 50 from twos. Yeah. Right. 33 okay. percent is equivalent to 50 from twos. Mm -hmm. So because, you know, you take 10 shots, you know, and you make a, you know, nine shots, and you make a third of them. And you've made nine points. You know, that's I mean, it's pretty sure. I mean, you get three points instead of two points. It's 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 acceptable. So but if I were playing today, I said two things I'd have to be better at. One, everybody raved about me being the first point forward. They you know, oh, God, he can really handle the ball. I was six, seven and a half and faster than most guards and quicker. And so that was something people didn't see. And then I could dribble the ball, righty, lefty, crossover. That's the extent of my ball handling. Hell, if I did anything other than that, my father, when I was young, would have put me on the bench. They didn't allow me through the legs behind the back, all that fancy stuff. And so if I was playing today, I would have to be a better ball handler. That's easy. All I would do is go into the gym and spend hours and hours and days and weeks and whatever, practicing, dribbling, one ball drills, two ball drills, and I'd become a way better ball handler. Very easy to do just by putting the time and the effort in. Because I had the other thing. I had the feel. I could see the court. I could see people open. I had that feel for the game. That's the one area I'd have to get a little better at. And the other area for me would be I would not be satisfied being a 33% three-point shooter. Mm -hmm. my, my goal would be 40% or better. Yeah. And that's really good shooting. That's really exceptional shooting. Yeah. Well, you were fundamentally so sound. You just talked about it. Kind of swinging into the European game, you're watching these younger European guys come over. You know, they, they're, they're, the skill level that they have, they're being taught uh, a lot of that, you know, the, a lot of skill is being taught overseas. And then they yeah, come into the. Basketball, Kevin. Because yeah. 
They're looking at all the videos and all the stuff about all the fundamentals of the game, which is so overlooked here because you got the AAU bullshit that goes on that so many of these AAU teams don't really teach kids. They just get the athletes, hey, go out there, run faster, jump higher, go out, just go out, score them, and don't teach them the game and put the fundamentals down that need to be done. And I'm not saying all of them are that way, but too many of them are. And they play way too many games and they're breaking people down. So – that's what happens is the European, why they're making an impact is because of the fact that they are learning the game fundamentally. So they have a good foundational base to build on. And now they're getting the better athletes to come in and play. And if you're a really good athlete and you have an understanding of how to play the game the right way, you can't help but be successful because you're going to have an edge over the other guy who isn't as good athletic. I mean, that's when you have that, it's, I think there's just so much of a gap now and we talk about AU and things like that. And it's, it's, it's just, the system is, is not based on developing your skills. It's based on just showcases. I mean, is there something to be said with uh, just playing versus being alone in a gym, like just going in. I mean, I feel like a lot of guys are just playing. And I always said like, you know, you play your, your way into certain things, but guys are almost playing more than they're developing. They're just playing. They're not working on their game on their own, working on individual play, things. You, can, you, can play, you shouldn't be out there playing until you're fundamentally sound because all you're going to do is develop a lot of bad habits. And the easiest thing in the world to do in life is to develop a bad habit. The most difficult thing is to break the bad habit. And so that's the difference. And and I say, because you, but you have to eventually play. I mean, sitting on the bench and watching, you can only learn so much. You still have to get out there and do it. OK, but you still want to be fundamentally sound. That's why when parents ask you, what can I do with my kid? I said, get them someplace that they're going to teach him the fundamentals of the game and really work on the fundamentals. And then when he's got it and he think, you know, he's doing really well with it, then find somebody who's even better at teaching the fundamentals and, and work on the fundamentals some more. Because the bigger the base, the taller the building. You can't build a skyscraper on a small foundation. It will topple over. So that's the thing that I got. My father was a strict fundamentalist. I had fundamentals drilled into me. If I didn't have ball man relationship or other things, hell, I was coming out of the game and sitting on the bench you know do it fundamentally sound and then if you're blessed with some god-given talent and abilities and you put your effort forth in that you can continually get better and you'll have a chance to maximize your potential there are guys playing in the nba today who are there on sheer incredible athleticism yeah. who will never be as good as they should be because they don't know how to utilize that incredible gift that they have to its fullest because they are fundamentally unsound yeah and Going into, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about fundamentals. Uh, when you look at kind of the the egos that players have these days, do you think that kind of goes into, you're, you're talking about improving your individual skills. You're even talking about, you know, why guys are so concerned with not just shooting, you know, if they're shooting underhand, it doesn't matter. Do you think ego plays a big part in like the modern day NBA where guys obviously, are like almost obviously. reluctant to work? Yeah, obviously, you know, obviously ego has a lot to do with it. And I always tell people when I talk to a team when I did do coaching and stuff, I say, guys, if we're going to be if we're going to be successful here as a team, it's only going to happen if every one of you takes your ego and puts it in the freaking closet for the next seven, eight months, because it is no longer about you. You are now a part of this team and is what can we do collectively as a team? to be successful. And sometimes that's going to require you to perhaps have to sacrifice a little bit. And if that's what it takes, then by God, that's what you should do. Now, conversely with that, coaches also have to understand that they should not be so set in their ways that they're going to force you to play the system they want to employ. A smart coach will put in a system that utilizes the skills, talents, and ability of his players and mm -hmm. so often that doesn't happen. Why do you think guys get traded, go someplace, become all-star players? It wasn't like he all of a sudden learned how to play. No, he went to go someplace where the coach actually let him do the things he was capable of doing instead of sticking him in the system. It's like taking a freaking thoroughbred racehorse and making him pull a plow. I, it's, it, I couldn't agree more. That is one of my biggest pet peeves with all sports. I mean, you... You, you, and even like the G, like if you're a GM and then you're a coach, like, shouldn't you be on the same page where you're like, you're, we're bringing this guy in and be like, okay, well, this is what he he's good at. So let's work on what this is, as opposed to bringing him in and being like, okay, he's going to fit the mold of me. No, you have to fit the mold of the player. Like the player's here to help you. You got to be able to adjust your coaching 
to help benefit him, which is in turn going to help benefit the team. Well, that's, you know, that, you know, without question. I mean, hell, I actually have one year that I played to the coach. Well, then let me run the pick and roll play. I said, You're joking, right? I said, my <laughs> God, I, said, I make a living off the pick and roll play. How the hell can we not be running the pick and roll play? I mean, it's nice. <laughs> and so it's amazing. It really is amazing. I mean, I, I think in all sports, I think coaches a lot of times get way too much credit, but I also think probably even more so they get way too much blame because yeah. as a coach, you're forced to coach the talent that's given to you by the general manager. I, I don't know why teams don't allow their coaches to pick their players, because then if the team isn't doing well, you have a justification for letting the coach go because they're not successful. And these are the players you wanted and you're not getting the job done. And so then you can fire them. So meanwhile, the general manager gives the guy a whole bunch of chicken and then you say <laughs> make chicken salad out of it. I mean, you know, that's not fair. It really isn't. I've had to go through that. I've experienced what that's like, man. If you don't get to pick your own players, yeah, you're at the mercy. You're at the mercy of the general manager, and then you have to be a miracle worker. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, or be lucky enough to have a general manager who did a hell of a job picking the right players, and then the coach does a good job of utilizing them effectively, and then that works pretty well. But if the general manager, whoever's picking the talent, doesn't get the right talent, you're not winning. I'm sorry. I don't care how great a coach you are. The only way you could win if you had lousy players is bring God down and let him pull a miracle. <laughs> Did you ever experience something like that? I know you got into coaching when you finished your basketball career and you've done you know, plenty of coaching in your life. Did you ever experience that where you and the general manager were like, listen, you know, you're, oh, you're God, bringing yes. this in? Oh, God, yes. I got. I wound up losing a job because of the fact I had a player I wanted to get. And the guy didn't, he, I said, well, where is he? He said, well, he didn't want to get up early to catch an early flight. I said, what? <laughs> I, what? <laughs> I said, you got to be freaking kidding me. And then I tried to get him. I said, listen, I have two players who are all-star players on one of my teams. I told them I want to trade them. I said, I have two other guys that can play as well or better than they can, and I don't have the problem that these guys provide. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, uh -huh. if you don't have – here's the thing. You have to be the master of your own definition. It's like being the captain of a ship. Just like I told Butch Beard, my teammate from the championship team, got a chance to coach him when he's coaching the Nets. He asked me if I would be an assistant coach for him. And I said, you know what, Butch? Yeah, I would do that. I, I think it would be great. And then Clifford Ray was there as his big man's coach. They wouldn't let him hire me. And I said, they what? He said, no, you have to have, you have to have, you have to have an assistant coach who is a former head coach. Okay. <laughs> and I said, Butch, you understand what they're saying? They're saying the moment things don't go well for yeah. you, who's taking your job? Uh huh. I said, you need to be the captain of your own ship. Have your own crew who's going to be there to back you up. And, yeah. and so, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that happens all the time. It's just so ridiculous. Give the coach the authority to pick his players, pick his assistants, and then it's on him. And if it doesn't go well, hey, get rid of him, get somebody else, bring somebody else in, let them have a chance to do it. Let him see what he could do with this personnel. And then when you're going to make changes or something, let him be in charge of doing that. And then you have every right in the world to fire that coach. But to fire a coach because you as the general manager gave him horse shit, and you tell him you want him to have a championship team, and he gets fired because he doesn't do it, is not fair. You talk a lot about your dad. You give your dad a lot of credit for being your early coach, for teaching you a lot of these things. In fact, the origin story of why you shot your free throws underhand was – based on your dad, can you get into the, that origin story of, you know, how you ended up shooting that style? Well, my father was a semi-pro player and coach, a very successful mm -hmm. and a good player. And back in those days, nobody shot one-handed when he was playing. I mean, that that came later on. A guy named Hank Lucetti, I think, was the first one-handed shooter from playing out. I think it was at Stanford. And then, then they got into the jump shot. But it was two-hand set shots and two hands underhand. And he just he said, son, I think you can do better. You could shoot a higher percentage if you switched to underhanded. I said, hey, dad, I can't be doing that. This girl shoot that way. I said, he said, he said, son, if you can shoot a higher percentage, you should give it a try. Because it's not about how you do it. It's about the results that all that matter. And he was relentless about it. And thank God he was, because I really didn't want to do it. And so finally, one summer, I just said, hey, okay, dad, I'll tell you what. Here's the deal. Uh, here's the deal. I will, uh, we tell this guy, I said, here's the deal. I'll try it. Let's do it. I did it to get him off my back. It was either for my junior <laughs> or senior year in high, in high school. And and so 
I worked really hard at it. And the more I worked at it, I said, wow, this is really pretty good. And I really got confident in it. And I wound up shooting over 80% that time. And I just kept getting better and better and better and better. And, uh, you know, but I was willing to try it. You see, I, same thing in life. I mean, I, I, I've, I've gone to people, I've reached out to some people and told some really big name players. I said, look, it, I'm, I'd be more than happy to work with you. I can show you a few things that would take your game to an entirely different level. And not one of them has ever taken me up on it. Not one. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, to me, it's unbelievable because if somebody's got a chance to show me a way to do something better, uh -huh. I want to hear about it. You know, I, I want to hear about it. And and I've done that. I've done that in golf. I changed my golf, you know, putting stroke to do it. I changed my my free throws because my dad told me that. And I'm always willing to hear it. Whatever it is, golf, same way. Somebody's got something else to show me something that's a little better. I had a guy show me a swing to it. I learned how to do the swing and I wound up winning a world long driving championship because I was willing to try something. So anyway, but I'm gonna I'm gonna have to run. Uh, yeah, it's been great talking to you. I think I've yeah. a new time. Of uh, course, if, you know if I if I had to do it over again, people always ask me if I had to do it over again. If I could be where I am today, have the most amazing wife I have, still have my son, the friends that I have, be where I am at this stage of my life, I probably would never have left the NBA. I would have stayed in the NBA. I think that that really caused a lot of problems as far as my reputation in the game and, and my stature in the game because. I gave up one of the best years of my, my life. I mean, I just got done, you know, second team, you know, second year in a row, first team all pro, as I said, all-star MVP, led the league in scoring, came almost close to winning a championship. We had a hell of a team. And and I, I played for the KYA Radio Wonders the next year. <laughs> it's, well, you, the my favorite thing about it, you have four boys, all of which Five. played pro basketball. Five, Five, sorry. All of which played pro basketball, which is like, think about the Mannings. You know, no, like no, there's no, there's nothing in any sport comparable to what's happened no. here. I was hoping I'd have one. It's ridiculous. Like, you know, five with college scholarships, all five to play professionally, all five really listically should have been NBA players. My son Scooter was the last cut by the Celtics. Bird and Mikhail said, Rick, your son should have made our team, but they only had 12 man rosters and they had 13 no cut contracts. So he played overseas till he was 40. My son Canyon should have gotten an opportunity to do it, but he never was. Why? I have no idea. Uh, because I know that, you know, when he, he, he was certainly as good or better than a whole lot of guys that were getting paid a lot of money on teams that had major flaws in their game. And he's, he's mm -hmm. a hell of a player and so freaking smart, knows the game so well. And, you know, 40 inch vertical athletic, 40% three point shooter. I mean, he really knows the game, but uh, it is what it is. I'm just grateful that uh, I have the family I have and that all of my children have done well for themselves and, um, just really truly blessed so anyway it's a pleasure talking to you uh, it's a pleasure rick i really appreciate you copping on this has been a lot of fun and i really appreciate it thank you so much for your time all right god bless you and your, your listeners thank you so much bye rick see you